kick off, I just need to collapse uh, the screen a little bit now. So bear with me, all the practicalities here are coming into play. So my name's John Fleming, as you probably know at this point. Um, so today we're going to be discussing psychological success for organizations and their employees. What a, what a mouthful that is. Um, <clears throat> So happy to, to do this lunch and learn in partnership with Republic of Work. So I think Angelica here from Republic of Work is on the call. So thanks very much for inviting me, Angelica. And I'm delighted to um, be a part of your um, series. And um, just to give you a little bit more information um, about that as well. Um, so just bear with me for a second now here, because of course I have to juggle all sorts of screens here. So just from Republic of Work's point of view, they have uh, just let me or have sent me some information to share with you about their, their Lunch and Learn. So welcome to the Republic of Work Lunch and Learn series. Uh, they're held every Tuesday at 1 p.m. in a webinar format. And there's a variety of topics uh, for all different sorts of shapes and sizes of businesses that you can learn from. And you can find the upcoming events for the webinars on the What's On section of the Republic of Work website, which is republicofwork.com. There we go. Now, back to the screen. Now, you can still all see my uh, screen here anyway, can you? Yeah, great. Okay, so I just need to get back on track with that. Okay, so like I said, I'm John Fleming. You can see my lovely picture there when I had hair before this quarantine business came, I decided to shave it all off. So I'm an executive coach, organizational consultant, psychosocial educator and counselor. How many more titles could a person have, you might ask? I call them out individually because they are uh, important to differentiate between the different roles that I do. Because in any day, I might be flicking between hats and it's really important for me as a professional to be able to take a hat off cleanly and put another hat on and really know what role am I in right now? So I suppose really the role I'm in right now is that I'm doing a piece of psychosocial education. I'm going to be sharing with you some information around a psychological theory that I use in my work. So for the benefits of the Lunch and Learn, that's, that's my role today. Um, and when I come off this call and hop on various other calls, I'm, I might be going into an executive coach role or I might be doing some counselling, depending on who I'm working with. So I'm based in Cork, but I work across multiple sectors in both Ireland and the UK. Um, I say multiple sectors because often uh, people end up working in a particular sector. I haven't tended to pigeonhole myself like that because I work with people and I find that there's people in every sector. And what's important is the people to me, even though the context might change and I can get to grips with the context very quickly. So, you know, whether it's pharmaceuticals or it's uh, not for profits or it's utilities or whatever it might be, what I'm really zoning in and looking at is the people. They're my priority. I want to get to know them. I want to find out how they're relating to each other. And that's what we're going to be talking a little bit more about today. So my kind of uh, tagline, I suppose, if you'd like it, or, or for want of a better phrase, is empower, discover, grow. That's what I am, aim to do in my work, no matter what role or hat I have on. So uh, it's been my experience. And again, that's my personal professional experience as opposed to it's uh, this is the way it is. Um, that organizations sometimes focus predominantly on tasks, processes and technology. Um, and sometimes as a result of that, they forget about their people um, and, their, and their selves. So some of the senior leadership can forget about themselves as individuals as well. They get subsumed by what they're there to do as opposed to how they're getting on. Um, and that can create a, new, a number of problems. So I'm really passionate about helping people in organizations um, to lose less and win more uh, by becoming psychologically su successful. So that's kind of a phrase I've coined myself. Um, and I'm going to talk to you more about what I think psychological success is as we move through uh, today's presentation. So it's important to note that my work is predominantly informed by transactional analysis, uh, theory and philosophy. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about what TA is uh, again as we move through the presentation. It's just a little bit about me. So some people might be wondering who I work with um, and I'm just going to share some of the clients that I work with. Um, previous, it's important to note into getting into doing these more people focused work. I had a number of roles. Uh, I was a retail manager for quite a, a number of time for uh, a footwear retailer. 
that you'll all know, but I shall not name. But if you go to my LinkedIn, you'll see who it is. Um, and uh, I also then became a management consultant um, as a result of that. I ended up doing a lot of project work and process improvement and customer experience improvement and that sort of thing for this retail company. Got a lot of experience and then moved into consultancy as a result. So I've kind of had a varied career. Uh, I, like, I like doing different bits uh, every day. So as a result, I have a, a variety of different clients. Um, so some of these clients I will do uh, more people focused work with, but some of them I'll still work traditionally with as well in kind of more uh, management consultancy space because that's still some of my work today. So I work with technology and consultancy clients, government bodies, financial services, utilities, health and wellness organizations, some retail companies and some not-for-profit organizations. So they would be some of my client base that I would work across with. So that's just to give you a kind of an idea of who, who I'm working with. It's quite diverse. Um, my core values, which I think are really important to share with you, are personal integrity. So I like to promote personal integrity in, in what I do, and I like my clients to understand what personal integrity is and to develop that for themselves, to take personal responsibility. So I very much lead by example in that. I take responsibility for what I need, what I do, and I really promote that in other people. Sometimes the breakdown in relationships that we're going to be talking along about later happen because of a lack of people taking personal responsibility for themselves, expecting other people to do things for them. Uh, authenticity, I think it's really important to be authentic and I'm really hitting hard here now as well, particularly in the emotional sphere. So, you know, really getting in touch with how we're feeling. Sometimes in business and in organizations, we think, no, you can't share how you're feeling here. That's not acceptable. Have to bottle it all up. And um, I kind of say, no, actually, that's, you know, who made that rule? So I really challenge that belief. I really encourage people to be authentic and to share how they're feeling with each other. And, you know, the results speak for themselves. People start getting on better and then they wonder why they weren't doing this sooner. And then equal dignity. So I really come from a place of, of equal dignity. And what I mean by that is kind of unconditional positive regard for other people. Um, in transactional analysis, we would say, I'm okay, you're okay. Um, or I plus you plus, which means that, um, yeah, I have unconditional positive regard for the other person. So sometimes their behavior might not be okay, but they are as a human being. So, so that's kind of some of where I'm coming from, some of my frame of reference. So I think it's important to share that with you. So the agenda, what are we going to do today? So we have an hour and we're now 16 minutes in. <laughs> so I can already say that we're probably not going to make the time boundary of two o'clock with questions included. So we'll talk a little bit about more about how we'll manage questions and that sort of stuff in a second. But for anybody who does have a hard stop at two o'clock, that's fine. That's no problem. Happy for you to drop off. Um, I am willing to share this deck with everyone who's attended. I'll explain later about how you can get that deck. And if you do have any questions because you've left it too and we're still going, feel free to contact me. I'm always happy to converse with people via email or on LinkedIn Messenger and, uh, and, and chat about things, you know, so, so feel free to, to get in touch. Always happy to have a conversation. So the agenda, we're going to do a little bit of co contracting, okay, uh, as a group and, and me as an individual, okay, and I'll talk a little bit about more about that in a second. Um, I'm going to talk about what transaction analysis is. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, from transaction analysis point of view, what, how we would look at the structure of personality to help you understand that from TA's perspective. Um, how our personality influences our communication. Uh, what a psychological game is. How to become aware of the games we play and how to foster, from my perspective, healthier cultures in our organisations. Now, it's important to note that this is a whistle-stop tour, people. You know, uh, this isn't a formal training in which we're going to get into deep uh, kind of analysis of individual scenarios, case studies, etc. I'm going to be very high level dipping into some theory that's at the foundation of what transactional analysis is about. And uh, even at that, I'm not going to be covering it all. <clears throat> so this is a taster, if you like. Um, so just to manage expectations on that. OK, so. Everybody's hearing me okay? Everything can see the screen okay? 
Great, wonderful. Okay, so my contract with you is that I will cover what's in the agenda and try, you notice the word try, to do it within the hour. Okay, that might be a challenge, uh, but we'll see how we get on. Uh, I will share the deck I've presented with you if you wish to have it. So again, I'll talk at the end about how you get that. For people who have to drop off at two o'clock, just drop me an email or contact me on LinkedIn for the deck uh, and I can, I can give it to you, I can, I can email it to you. And um, I'll be available to answer questions at any point uh, throughout the presentation and at the end. So really what I'm saying there is I'm giving people permission to come off mute and to say, John, stall on there now for a second. Can you talk a little bit more about what's going on here? I'm very happy to get into a little bit of dialogue with people, but of course I may have to manage that and I might have to say, okay, we're gonna to need to leave that there and move on because I also have a responsibility to try and do this within the time frame given as best as I can, okay? So our group contract then, I've taken the liberty of putting together a few ground rules for you, <laughs> for all of us, okay? Uh, normally, if we were in person, I would do maybe do this as more interactive piece, but uh, that's a little bit more challenging when we're all online. So I'm asking you to keep your microphone on mute unless you're talking. Just the reason for, for that is so it avoids an, an echo for people. Um, my experience of using these platforms over the last month or so is when people aren't on mute, there can be an echo. Uh, cameras on so we can see each other would be preferable for me. I'd really like to, to make contact with people and see people. And uh, so, yeah, that's, that's just a request from me. Confidentiality. So what's shared in the group stays in the group. So if I do share anything uh, that is about a client, obviously I'll be keeping it anonymous anyway, but I would still rather that you don't go off and then talk about that to other people and say, oh, your man, John Fleming, that I was on the Lunch and Learn with told me X, Y, Z. You know, I'm sharing it with you because I, for the purpose of learning, but not for gossiping. So no gossiping. Um, what I am happy for you to share, of course, is I'm happy for you to share the learning. You can definitely take that off and share that with other people. So some of the theory, okay? Uh, to be respectful and courteous. So we might get into a discussion, we might not. If we do, just to be respectful that different people might have different points of view and different uh, opinions on things, and that's okay. So just going back to that equal dignity piece, uh, we can have different opinions and, and we can still all be okay. Uh, to take care of your own needs and comforts. That's, I'm pointing a little bit there now to what I said earlier about taking personal responsibility. So take care of yourself, do what you need to do. If you need to go to the toilet, go to the toilet, you know, and then you can come back again afterwards. Uh, but don't sit there feeling like, oh, I have to stay on now for the hour. Um, and uh, your learning is your responsibility, not mine. So if it's not making sense to you, you need to ask a question so that you can understand it. So um, what I'm hinting at there now again is another bit about taking personal responsibility. So you can kind of see my core values coming out through my work here now and how I manage situations and people. So I'm, I'm really saying you have responsibilities here today then I want you to take those responsibilities and own them. So you take care of your needs, you take care of your own learning. If I'm discussing something or explaining something or teaching something and it's not making sense to you, um, then it's your responsibility to bring that to my attention and say, John, I need you to go over that again. And I'll happily do that. Uh, but what I won't be doing is kind of like, is everybody getting that now? Uh, because that, I think that's quite patronizing. I'm just going to assume it's making sense unless you tell me otherwise. Is that okay? Great. So enjoy, try and enjoy it. It'd be great if you could. It'd make it all the more fun for everybody. Um, and uh, maybe we could have a bit of fun. That's often easier again in person than it is on Zoom. So we'll do our best. So what is TA? So transactional analysis at its core is a social psychology. Um, it's developed by Eric Byrne. Um, his theory consists of key concepts that practitioners use to help clients, students, uh, systems analysis and change of patterns interaction that inf interfere with achieving life aspirations. So over the past 40 years, Burns theory has evolved to include applications in counselling, education, organisational development and psychotherapy. But it was really originally a psychotherapeutic um, theory. OK, but it's expanded now because uh, transactional analysts all over the world have realised that TA is applicable wherever there is people. Um, and we're, it's a social psychology, so we're really looking at the social relationships that happen. So what might be different from other modalities in this, because I get asked this all the time, is the social aspect of it. So we're not just looking at what's going on for me, 
we're looking at what's going on for me and what's going on between you and me and how to understand that dynamic. So that may be the slight difference with TAs. It's looking at what's going on between I and another person. So uh, moving on, we're going to look a little bit then, like I said, a personality structure. So from transactional analysis perspective, we would look at something called an ego state to understand the structure of the personality. So at a very high level, an ego state is something that has thoughts, feelings and behaviors in it. OK, so very simple concept and um, how those thoughts, feelings and behaviors um, interact is that an ego state is a consistent pattern of feeling and experience directly uh, related to a corresponding consistent pattern of behavior. So it's like I feel and experience this and as a result, I do this and they always correspond and happen uh, together. OK. Now, it's important to mention at this point as well that like any theory, this isn't 100% accurate, okay? It's a theory, okay, which means that it helps us understand something to a level. But there will always be things that operate outside that. There will always be um, extenuating circumstances, if you like. But we know from research and from years of working directly with people that this ego state model really helps people to understand where their thoughts, feelings and behaviours are coming from and why they might be that way. OK, so I remember when I came across this first when I was a junior manager in the UK and um, I was blown away by it. You know, I was thinking, oh, that's where this has come from. That's what's happening here. That's what's going on between me and this other manager. And I was just like, this answers so many questions for me, you know. So obviously I have a complete bias because I just think it's absolutely wonderful <laughs> and you might not. And, and that's OK. Um, I suppose I'm incredibly passionate about it, but I have to remember that that's because it has been incredibly useful to me in my career, but also in my personal journey. And what I have found from working with different people is that an awful lot of these theories and practices are really coming at things from uh, different angles, but they're all aiming to get the same result. So while TA has been an exceptionally potent uh, piece of theory and set of models for me, for other people, it might be something else like cognitive behavioral therapy or something uh, similar to that. Uh, so it's just important to, to note that, that, you know, none of these theories are the be all and end all. But by the end of today, I might have you thinking TA is. <laughs> and I wanted to point out the reason for that, because it is incredibly important to how I do my work. So. If we've got the concept of, of an ego state now, okay, now I want to expand what I'm talking about when I'm talking about an ego state and say that the suggestion here is that we have three ego states, okay? We have a parent ego state, an adult ego state, and a child ego state, okay? So the parent ego state has attitudes, behaviors, thoughts, and feelings taken from parents or parental figures, okay? What we mean by parental figures here is when you were a little person, any of the big people that you spent a lot of time around. So that might have been a teacher. It might have been an uncle, an aunt, a much older brother or sister. OK, so anybody that would have had a type of parental influence on your life. OK, so we're saying that a parent ego state is attitudes, behaviors, thoughts and feelings taken from parents and parental figures. The child ego state then is behaviors, thoughts and feelings replaced from childhood and childhood decisions. Uh, sorry, I said replaced, replayed. OK, they're archaic. They, they, they did happen. And now sometimes they come back and interfere with your life. And then adult ego state are behaviors, thoughts and feelings, which are a direct response to current reality. So what we're talking about here now with the adult ego state is the here and now reality. If any of you do meditation or any kind of grounding work like that, and uh, they talk about getting grounded, really the adult ego stage is about being grounded. It's about being in the here and now reality and responding to things in a here and now way. OK, so, of course, these ego states um, afford us the options of reacting to things in different ways. So you might have a parentified 
response. You might have a childish response. You might have an adult response. I think what's really important to note here is that we're not suggesting um, that, you know, adults are the answer, you know, <laughs> or that, um, uh, that it's an adult uh, thing because of course a, a child can have an adult response you know if they're reacting to the here and now so um, it's important to understand the context with that that um, this isn't just something you have access to once you become an adult this is something that everybody has and as they grow and develop you formulate these we're talking here about years three to seven okay in terms of child development theory um, about when these really get populated now, you might be wondering, what do they get populated with? Well, there is a model in ego state theory, which you can go off and look up and read about if you choose to, called the structural model. OK, it's the structural ego state model. And that will talk in more detail about family lineage, ancestry and your own parents and other parental figures and how they have populated your ego states. OK, so we can get into a whole rabbit hole now, excuse the pun, about um, talking about uh, kind of epigenetics. OK, so that might be a term that some of you are familiar with, others not. Um, you can go look it up on Google if you want to make a note of it afterwards. But essentially, epigenetics is we're talking about how things get passed down psychologically rather than physically. OK, uh, so the suggestion here from an epigenetics point of view is that things get passed down psychologically in families. OK, so, you know, some people say, oh, I opened my mouth and my mother came out, you know, at a certain stage of life that happens to some people. And they're like, oh, no, it's finally happening. My worst <laughs> nightmare. I am becoming my parent. And, and we all think that that's the most awful thing. Um, that could possibly happen to us, you know, um, when, of course, uh, it may or may not be, you know, depending on who our parents are. Um, but, uh, I, oh, yeah, <laughs> I'll just have a chuckle for a second. Um, so moving on from there, really, I suppose, what we're going to look at today, because we're not going to look at the structural model, because it wouldn't be appropriate at this level for me to take people in that that direction okay so i also have the duty of care today in what i discuss and share with you that it doesn't overstimulate anybody to get into a process about them and their lives so we're not going to get into the structural model but i'm just hinting and suggesting that that's something you might like to go and read about if you're um, taking that direction i'm going to look at it much more from a kind of an organizational view today okay in how this model helps us when we're in work and working with people so if we move on from the basic ego state model, which is on the screen, and we can go on to something called the functional model, okay? So we're not covering the structural model. That's really about how did the stuff that's in there get in there in the first place, okay? Telling you, you can go off and look up that if you want to, or get in contact with me, and I'm happy to share some literature. What we are going to do is we're going to look at the functional model. So in the functional model in transaction analysis, what we've done is we've broken down the parent-child ego state into different sections, okay? So if we take the parent ego state first, it's broken into two sections, which is the critical parent and the nurturing parent, okay? So the critical parent is moralistic, judgmental, authoritarian. The nurturing parent is reassuring, caring, encouraging, supportive, and understanding. OK, so that's pretty easy to see those two sides of kind of parentified behavior. You know, you can have the really nurturing, but also the very much like, uh, well, you're never going to be good enough. You know, you need to go clean your room. Your room's never clean enough, that sort of thing. If I was with you in person now, I'd be standing up doing a little acting piece uh, to help you understand exactly how these uh, critical and nurturing parent actually behave both physically and in their language. You know, I think for the critical parent, the thing that is always very evident is they normally have a wagging finger of some sort. Um, you know, and, and that's, that's out uh, as a focus <laughs> in that one. If we move then down to the child ego state, you've got the rebellious child and the adapted child, which are kind of two halves of the same uh, side. So the rebellious child is defiant and complaining and the adapted child is compliant and passive. OK, but then on the other side, you've got the free child, which is curious, energetic, fun loving and spontaneous. 
that's the bit of all of us that loves to have fun. Okay. So when, when we can, if we can all maybe just close our eyes for a second and just take a, a, a moment to think about and get in touch with something we just really love doing, you know, that when we're doing it, we just have so much fun and it's, you know, you feel like a child again. When we're doing that activity, when we're partaking that, we're really accessing our free child. And that is just great. Like I know that every time I pass a swing, if I get on it and if I swing, I'm just going to have so much fun. It's just like being right back to being five, six, seven in the playground again. And unfortunately, what happens sometimes is we lose access to that part of ourselves because, you know, we have to become uh, serious grown-ups and serious grown-ups don't have fun. No, nope, no time for that. Absolutely not. We have to do serious grown-up things and we have to go to work every day and we have to be really serious all of the time. And when other people aren't pulling their weight, we have to be really critical and tell them that, you know, you're not doing your job right. And I have to pull all the weight here and it's not fair. And now you can see I'm really getting into a critical parent process now. And that's the part of my ego state structure that kind of overwhelms me and takes control of how I am and the way I behave because there is no room to have fun here. Uh, so you can see how as we grow up, sometimes there's a process that plays out for us that takes us away from who we really were or uh, maybe who we want to be. Um, so again, I'm just giving hints here at different things, okay? Um, again, I would go into this in a much more detail in an extensive training um, or if we had longer. And then the adult ego state, as before, is non-judgmental, open-minded, interested, confident, and reality-based. OK, so, so that's a very adult response to things when you're coming from an adult place. So I think um, at this point now, I'll just pause for a second and see if anybody wants to interrupt me and ask questions. Normally, at this point, people are kind of have queries or concerns or wonderments. But if you don't, that's OK, too. We can move on. So if we think now about our structure of our personality, OK, it's possible that they're not even pieces, you know, so this diagram shows them as even pieces. But actually, a person could have very little nurturing parent, very little free child, could have a whole load of critical parent and a whole load of rebellious child. And, and that might be all that's there. And similarly, the circles could be bigger than each other. So the parent circle could be huge, okay? Uh, the adult might be smaller. The child might be in between. All of that would suggest uh, to us that, um, that there's an imbalance of some sort, okay? And I want to tread really carefully when I use the word imbalance. You know, I'm not talking about pathology here or, or anything of that sort or say that the, you know, <laughs> the person's a nut job or anything like that, you know, because of course that's the really distasteful part of, of kind of maybe the more traditional viewpoints on psychology and psychotherapy that I very much stay away from and urge people to stay away from because I don't, I don't think pathology is helpful. Um, I think it, it enters people into a process of just thinking about what's wrong with them. And really what I want to help people do is to find out what's right with them to get in touch what's right and healthy with them and to expand on that and to get more of that into their lives. Uh, because I take that very much from a meditation training that I, I've done previously about focusing on what you want as opposed to what you don't want. But nonetheless, the reality could be that there could be an imbalance here. And, and really what I would work with people to do if I was using a model like this is to say, okay, so where is your nurturing side? You know, when was the last time you felt like being nurturing? Is your nurturing side something that you just don't want to share with other people because you're afraid, you know, you have to be strong and tough and seen as serious because your, your role requires that? You know, when did you make that decision? So I'd be looking to try and do some coaching then and exploring around, you know, when was it that you last remember accessing that part of yourself? If we were looking at the structural model here, which we're not, we might be looking at what were their parents like? 
you know, and I might be going down that road in a more counseling role. So if I was doing counseling with somebody and not coaching, because then it would be appropriate and ethical to do so. If we had a contract in place to explore their parental relationships, then I might be, you know, asking questions like, hey, well, can you tell me about what your parents were like when you were a little child? And how did they behave with you? And what sort of messages did they send you? And what sort of things did they say to you? So then that, that's where I might be getting at the content of their ego states, trying to find out how did it get populated in this way? Now, this begs the question, doesn't it? If it did get populated cert a certain way, i.e. there's a huge amount of critical parents and not a lot of nurturing parent, is it possible to develop? The answer is very short, yes. We all have an innate ability to be nurturing, to be free. It's just there. Unfortunately for some people, it's just they haven't figured out how to access it yet. And my job when I'm working with them is to help them do that. So, you know, this is where I might suggest kind of off the wall things, because, of course, exploring these aspects of yourselves and getting in touch with them often means that you have to do things that are outside your comfort zone. So you've all seen that circle where there's the, your comfort zone and then your uncomfortable zone and then change, learning, etc. So I would be inviting people to move out. So, you know, I have done things. So one of my one of my main clients um, at the moment around uh, this sort of work where I've been working with management and leadership and coaching them would be Google. So a huge amount of work with their sales team in Dublin. And um, there's a playground not too far away from the Google office. So, you know, I, I have taken people there and, and I've said, you know, actually what we're going to do for an hour today is we're just going to have some fun. And, you know, before we've left that office, they're already getting a little bit panicked. You know, they're kind of thinking, oh, God, like I should really just go back to my desk. And, uh, you know, we'll contract around that, you know, and, and we'll make an agreement, you know, like if we get there and you don't feel comfortable, we can go. You know, that's no problem. But, you know, will you agree to, to give it a go? So, of course, what I'm really inviting here is for the child to, within them to come out and play, you know. And that can be an uncomfortable process, believe it or not. But the, the benefits of exploring it and getting to know that side of yourself is that it has, can have a huge impact on you as a management or leader in an organization, how you communicate with other people and how you grow your relationships with those people. So it may seem like I'm taking them in a very bizarre direction to get that result, but actually I'm not. Because I know that the results show if we can really help them understand who they are, why they are the way they are, to get unknown, uh, to get to know the kind of unresourced aspects of themselves and to grow them and resource them, they become much more well rounded, grounded people, you know. And I can actually say that I know that from personal experience because I was one of those people. I had somebody training me in transaction analysis. I had a coach, I had a therapist when I was training and I was one of those people. I was one of those really hard to believe. I know I was one of those really serious, you know, have to work 24 seven, no fun. Uh, definitely wouldn't be going to any sort of playground or doing arts crafts or anything because you no, know, who, who, what sort of serious, uh, you know, ambitious adult would be doing activities like that. Absolutely not. Uh, I was one of those people and I uh, was just lucky that I met the right people at the right time. Um, I found transactional analysis. It really helped me to learn who I was, where I had come from, why I was the way I was and, um, and develop and, and grew resource myself and get to know the full extent of my personality. And now I can access my free child much more, which is wonderful. And I can really get in contact with my nurturing side. I can be much more nurturing now than I was ever able to do before, which for me in my work is incredibly important because really what I am doing all of the time is nurturing people. And if I was to remain exceptionally critical, that wouldn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> because if clients weren't getting results and I was saying, well, you're just not doing it right, <laughs> that wouldn't work very well in what I do today. So that's just a little bit of context to help you understand where I'm coming from. I think the important thing to note here as well, guys, at this point is that 
it would be easy to walk away from today and think that, oh yeah, critical parent is bad, nurturing parent is good, free child is good, rebellious and adaptive child is bad. That's easy. We can tie that up now and parcel it and I've got that as a nice takeaway. Great. And I'll print this model off and I'll stick it on my wall and I'll be the best business owner, manager, leader there ever was. End of story. It's not that simple. Nothing in life is black and white. There is negatives to all of them. There is positives to all of them. So nurturing parent can become overpowering. It can become what I call marshmallowing, where it gets so sweet, it's sickly. You know, like when you eat marshmallows, one or two is nice, but when you have five, you feel a bit sick afterwards because of all the sugar. Well, being nurtured can feel like that to some people. So if it's too much, you can feel kind of uh, engulfed, uh, like you're being wrapped in cotton wool and you kind of just have the sense of, oh, I want them to go away. I want them to get off and back. They're being nice, but I don't like it. <clears throat> Same with critical parent. That can be positive. But of course, it's how you, uh, it's in how you uh, put it across. So when a five-year-old child that is under your care runs down the street very close to where oncoming traffic is and you say, stop, that's positive. <laughs> you need to do that for the care of that child. But at that time, you were accessing the critical side of your parent ego state. So that is a positive use of it. So as, we, as you can see now, this is very layered, okay? And I can go into multiple layers, but I'll stop there. But what I'm just suggesting is <clears throat> don't walk away from today that just thinking, oh yeah, this side's good, this side's bad, easy peasy, lemon squeezy, got it. it it's not that simple. So it's about being able to look at these things from all different angles uh, to make sense of them. Okay, how are we doing, folks? Is this all making sense to people? Mm hmm Yeah, great, good, okay. Flicking through my, my videos here now to see you all putting your thumbs up. That's great. Giving me a wonderful sense of satisfaction. I'm doing a good job. Pat on the back. Very good, okay. So what we'll move away from now is, because I've given you a kind of a high level introduction to personality structure from TA's perspective. So you, you've got that now. Put that on the shelf for a second, but bring it with you at the same time, okay? You're going to need it in a second. So what we're going to talk about next is something called transactions. So now you might be starting to understand where transactional analysis got its name, okay? We're going to talk about transactions, and this is where the communication element comes in, okay? So talk about personality now. We're moving on to how your personality can impact your uh, communication. So... Eric Byrne said that a transaction consisting of a single stimulus and a single response, verbal or nonverbal, is a unit of social action, which essentially um, means when I say hello and you say hello back, we, we, we've had a transaction. There's been a stimulus and a response, okay? And then every time I say something and you reply, that's an individual transaction. OK, so you can see now where he was coming from when he named it, that god awful name that's done us no favours whatsoever because everybody thinks I work in financial services and not in psychology um, is transactional analysis. Because what Eric Byrne was doing in the very early days of TA, which we don't do so much anymore, is he was analysing transactions between people. So he may, in a client case, actually write down every single transaction that happened okay and then they would agree between them uh, what ego state did that come from and what ego state did i reply from to get a sense of how we're communicating okay is this all making sense to people i'm not being too abstract because i'm going to move on in a second and and uh and look at, at some diagrams that will explain it more but i think that that's probably enough for now so the first thing that we're going to look at is uh, complementary transactions, okay? Oh, and I've noticed here that there is a chat that I did not see, and I have five messages. So I will take a look at them briefly. Oh, somebody just saying that, apologies, the PC doesn't have webcam for video. That's absolutely fine, no problem. Which, Vanessa Williams, which field have I trained in? I've trained in the educational field, also in the psychotherapy field, 
and in the organizational field, Vanessa. Uh, what is the primary purpose of this model? Okay, sorry, Seamus, I didn't see your, your message when you sent it. So uh, if you want to come off mute for a second, uh, Seamus, Thanks, Jan. No, I, the other, the next message was I have to leave to, to, to bring somebody to work. So I was going to ask you to, yeah. if I could follow up with that with you later on, if that's yeah. okay. That's no problem. Yeah. So you'll find me on LinkedIn, Seamus, or if you get in touch with Republic of Work, they can give you my email address. I'll do that. Let's, thanks. Apologies for, for, for kicking off and good to meet you all. I'll talk that's to you again no soon. Problem at all. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks. No problem. Bye. Great. Well, I have the chat open now. So if other people are using it, I know it's there. See, we're all learning. Great. Okay now so um and uh well i won't be able to see one person who said that they don't have webcam but um i'm wondering if vanessa is is there uh if you maybe put your hand up i'll make contact with you vanessa don't know are you there no no not too sure it's all right okay so here we go, back to complementary transactions. So a complementary transaction is one in which the transactional vectors, which are the arrows you'll see in a second, are parallel and the ego state addressed is the ego state that responds, okay? So if I say, what time is it, okay? And the other person responds four o'clock, just as I've said it there, then that is an adult to adult complementary transaction. Does that make sense? Very standard sort of interaction that you might have with somebody. Okay. So like I was mentioning earlier, what we're really getting to grips with now is how do my ego states interact with your ego states? <laughs> okay. So this is an adult, adult transaction and we do these all of the time. Now, if I was to change my tone slightly, it might be a different direction. Okay. So if I was to say, tell me what time it is that might be a parent to child transaction, okay? And then I have a choice about how I respond. I could say, oh, sorry, it's, um, it's 1.30. That would be me responding from child, okay? Back to parent, which would still be complementary because the vectors would still be running alongside each other, okay? But if I was to say, it's 1.30 and I was to respond from adult, then what might happen is that the transaction would cross and that's what we're going to look at next. So in crossed transactions, if I say well, what time it is from adult to adult, but somebody replied, time you bought a bloody watch, then that would be from parent to child. Okay, so can you see now about what the difference is here? Okay, so there was a slight tone change language is a bit abrupt. I didn't actually get an answer to my question. So there wasn't a here and now reality response. Okay. So a cross transaction is one in which the transactional vectors um, are not parallel or in which the ego state addressed is not the one that responds. Is that making sense to people? Yeah. Now, again, there's a whole multitude of examples you could get into around both complementary and cross transactions that I'm not going to cover today because remember this is just a whistle stop tour and I'm just ducking in giving you a very kind of a taste for what it looks like so I don't want anybody walking away thinking oh yeah that's it there's two types of uh, transactions this is what they look like remember the arrows could be going anywhere and depending on where they're going it might be a different type of transaction but it might also be, the ego states might also be different, okay? But this is just to give you an idea. Now, when we go back up to complementary, with a complementary transaction, it's important to note that this doesn't mean that it's healthy, okay? So in the example shown, adult to adult, that seems healthy enough, but there might be a different type of complementary transaction that isn't very healthy. So for example, if I was a manager, Okay, and I was saying, is the report ready yet? And I was saying that from my parent ego state to, my, to the child ego state of my employee. And the employee was responding from the child ego saying, saying, oh, um, no, uh, it's not ready yet. I'll have a few in just a second. Okay, you have to ask yourself, is that a really healthy dynamic to have in a workplace? 
Probably not, because there's some sort of like fear and intimidation being imposed by the use of your apparent ego state. There's some suggestion that they have power over you, you know, kind of this old fashioned hierarchical thing. So rather than working together now, it's like you're working for me. And uh, that's the sort of stuff that I try and help people become aware of in their management style and suggest, not tell, but I would give a very strong invitation and suggestion to avoid. Um, again, there's a time and a place for using your parent ego state, but in situations like that, you know, wouldn't it be better if we could just talk from adult to adult and say, okay, it's not ready. And then you'd say, well, you have a deadline of 1.30, so you need to make the deadline. That's a very adult transaction. You know, you, the, the nuances with this and the subtleties are in the tone and often the facial expression and the posture and the body language, okay? That's the bit that I might be getting, might not be getting across to you as clearly today as if I was standing up at a podium in front of you and acting it out, which I often do when I'm doing this training, okay? Is that, that it is very nuanced and um, that the subtleties are in the body language, facial expression and tone, okay? That can very much uh, tell us then in that case, which ego state it's coming from, even though the language the words used might be the same, but the other three factors are, will help us understand where it's coming from. The cross transaction then, okay, um, isn't necessarily unhealthy, okay? That's the, the, the trick here. In this instance, it probably isn't helpful because I just asked what time it was and the person just told me that I should get a bloody watch, which wasn't very friendly or nice. But a cross transaction can be helpful for avoiding something which we're coming on to next, which is psychological games. So the suggestion here is that if you want to avoid uh, playing psychological games, often you can use a cross transaction to do that. Okay, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a few moments. So the last type of transaction then is an ulterior transaction and we'll all be really familiar with these. So uh, this is... An ulterior transaction is uh, where two messages are conveyed at the same time, okay? So at the social level, I might say to uh, somebody I'm working with, is that report ready yet? And they might say no in that tone. So that very much is adult to adult at the social level. But we both know because we have a somatic response, which means that we have this response in our body that tells us, that actually there was subtext to what was just said. And when the person asked me if the report was ready or not, what they were really saying is that you're not a good enough employee. And when they said no back, what they were really saying is that you're always having a go at me. So that was the message at the psychological level, okay? So we've all been in situations where we've just had a feeling, okay? And it's really important to note here that sometimes, <clears throat> we might get confused because we might be thinking maybe i'm just fantasizing this like maybe i'm just making this up that this dynamic is going on between us and actually it's very hard to know whether you are having a fantasy or not and whether you are making it up in your head or whether it's really going on i think it takes time and it takes time to get in touch with your intuition and to learn to trust it to be able to figure out when there's an ulterior transaction but we've all been on the receiving end of them and we've all had this kind of um edge inside us that goes oh that didn't feel right it seemed like everything was okay on the surface but it's not okay so that's the third and final type of transaction then so we've covered uh three transactions so what i'm going to just suggest for that you do for a moment if you are a note taker is that you just take a minute to write down what has happened so far in the session and what are you learning about yourself and others so you might be already taking notes where you're actually just writing down some of the theory I'm covering. I'm asking you two specific questions here uh, that you just take a minute to make very quick notes where you write down what has happened so far in today's session, could be bullet points, and what are you learning about yourself and others?
Great. Okay. So what we're going to move on to now next is we're moving on to games, okay? Psychological games, which is our kind of last piece of theory that we're going to cover today. So a game is a series of ulterior transactions with a gimmick leading to a usually well-conceived but well-defined payoff. That's what Byrne said a game was. What does that mean? What's important for you to take away even if you don't understand the rest of it, is that a game is a series of ulterior transactions. We just covered off what ulterior transactions are. Okay, so ulterior transactions are where there's two messages conveyed at the same time, one at a social level and another at a psychological level. Okay, so a game is a series of those. So what I'm going to look at today with you to help you understand games is I'm going to look at something called the drama triangle, which is a transactional analysis model. It's probably the most mugged off model in the world in the sense that people all across uh, organizational consultancy, training, development, use this model without referencing it, which is, of course, to us in the TA community is very annoying. Um, because for ethical purposes and integrity and respect and all the rest of it, it's important to reference things accurately. So the person that uh, developed this model is named Stephen Cartman, and he developed it in 1968. He was one of the key followers of Byrne after Byrne's initial theory was developed. And he helped, or he developed the drama triangle to help people understand uh, what psychological games were all about. So on the drama triangle, you've got three roles the persecutor, the rescuer, and the victim. So when you've got a series of ulterior transactions between two people, they could be playing any of these roles. There's always a victim, and then there's usually either a persecutor or a rescuer. Sometimes they move between those roles as well. A persecutor has the mentality that I am better than you, you are inferior. The rescuer has the mentality that I know more than you do. You are inadequate. And the victim has the mentality that I am helpless and you are better than me. So unfortunately, these dynamics play out all day long, every day. All across the world, in every family, in every workplace, in every social setting. We play games more than we sleep. We play games all day long with each other. And sometimes they're healthy, but most of the time they're not because they end up leaving us feeling crappy. So if you can put yourself on the drama triangle and just imagine for a second what it might feel like to come at these different roles. Normally we have a role that we were more attracted to. Like I definitely played a lot of victim and rescuer. They were, they were my kind of go-to spots on the drama triangle. Um, so I would I would kind of get into uh, trying to take care of people, you know, fix things for other people when I wasn't asked to. Just checking it here now. I have. Do do. Oh, very good. Okay, that's no problem, Vanessa. And that's no problem, Megan. So, okay, I need to go back a slide for somebody for a second. Now so. In a dialogue, can a person be both the victim and the rescuer in front of a persecutor? Okay, what might be helpful here is if you put your microphone on and we can have a discussion about it. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? Yeah, good, thank you. Cool, so do you want to repeat your question so everybody can hear what you're asking? Yeah, sure, so I asked in a dialogue, can a person be both the victim and the rescuer in front of a, a persecutor? Um, what I meant was like, uh, you stated how they are um, in both, um, you know, states. You said like, 
the victim says that I am helpless, you are better than me, and the rescuer said that you know, I know more than you do. Uh, so yeah. what I thought of, mm -hmm. uh, in front of a persecutor, um, mm -hmm. can the victim also think that they know better than them, but they also stay in a passive side? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that, that is possible. Often what happens is that we move around, okay? So for one set of ulterior transactions, I might be in a victim role and the other person might be in a persecutory role. For the next set of transactions, I might move into the persecutory role and I might persecute the persecutor and then put, push them into victim. Does that make sense? So if I, if I use a contextual example, if I say to somebody in a workplace, is that report ready yet? You're always late getting that report and it has to be done by 1.30 every Wednesday. I don't understand why you're always late getting it done, okay? Very clear to see that person's coming from a persecutor place and is inviting the other person to play a victim role. Now, I have a choice. This is the key piece here about this theory. I have a choice about how I respond. I might not be aware of the choice, but the choice is there. And this is the work that I do with people is to help them become aware that they do have a choice. I can choose to take up the invitation and to enter a victim role. Now, the other person might well know that I have a tendency to do that anyway. So uh, it might be easy for me to fall into that. And I might kind of be like, oh, um, I'm, oh, I'm really sorry. Um, I'll get it done for you now. You know, that sort of thing. Or I might say, okay, why don't uh, you go away and when you're more relaxed, we can have a conversation about it uh, because I don't want to talk to you right now because you seem really worked up about it. And I think it would be better for both of us if we ended this conversation and picked it up later and we can have a chat about it then. Now, you're really straddling the line there between moving into your adult ego state and trying to step off the drama triangle or also becoming persecutory because if you certain language will have a tendency to evoke certain reactions. So like me saying, you seem to be pretty worked up right now might be a persecutory statement. Does that make sense? Or it might not. It's very hard, you know, to straddle this line. Um, or what I might do is I might become really inflamed and be like, you're always shouting at me. Why do you always do this? You are the worst manager in the world. I hate you. You know, that sort of thing. And then, of course, what I do is I move into the uh, persecutor role. Now, it's important to note that there's very few workplaces where it probably gets to this extent where there's actual shouting and kind of getting into a, a match. Oftentimes, drama triangle in organizations being played out much more subtly. I kind of get into the theatrics of it in these sessions to help people understand what it, what it feels and looks like but oftentimes it can be much more subtle in organizations. So you might not be as aware that somebody is persecuting you, even though that's actually what they're really doing. Because remember, in the ulterior transactions, their language might suggest that they're being adult and nice to you, but actually on the psychological level, they're persecuting you. Is, is that helpful? In, in the other sense then, um, if there was a bystander the bystander might get involved and might try and rescue the victim. So if there was a colleague nearby, the colleague might step in and say, oh, why don't you leave her alone? Or why don't you leave him alone? You know, you're always, you're always giving out to that person. And then, of course, what that bystander has done is they've now just got involved in the game and they've become the rescuer. And then what might happen is the victim might persecute the rescuer and say, why don't you stay out of this? You're always getting involved in other people's business. And now what happens is the rescuer becomes the victim, the victim becomes the persecutor, and now the original persecutor is the bystander. Does that make sense? Okay, so you can see from that little example about how people might move around. So it's important to know that games uh, whenever we play a game, we, we step into one of the three roles. Um, each role entails a discount of the self and the other person, okay? What I mean by discount is we're discounting something about ourselves, so we're ignoring an opportunity we have or a skill that we have or a compassion that we might have. We're discounting it. Games are played without adult awareness, so they're not played from the adult ego state. 
So they're played out of adult awareness. Games usually end in one or both players feeling happy. And wonder who's not on mute. I'm trying Just to tell my sister to talk and come do Duolingo. Who is not on mute? Oh. Okay, I think I found them. I think I found the culprit. Um, I wonder what language they're learning on Duolingo, though. <laughs> um, so, uh, the last bit then around games is we usually have preferred roles, okay, and we usually seek others who will relate and will play a complementary position so that the game can be played. So, what I'm saying there is we have uh, kind of like extra senses for spotting out people who will play our games with us. So you may or may not have had experiences in your life where you've um, started new jobs. And when you're going into the new job or into the new role, you're saying to yourself, okay, I'm not going to make all the mistakes I made in the last place. Now, this might be just yourself. This isn't something that you've ever told to anybody, but you might be thinking this internally. And you know, I'm not going to do any gossiping and I'm going to get on with everybody and I'm going to stay out of all of the office politics. I'm not going to get involved. I'm not doing it this time. <laughs> okay. And then like within the first day you've met that person, you know, and you had that person in the last organization as well. And it's the person you do all of your kind of uh, bitching and office gossiping with and they actually end up being your best work friend. And then, you know, weeks pass by and you're like, oh crap, I've ended up doing the same thing in this job that I did in the last job. And you know, I'm only able to share that with you because I've done that. You know, I've done that in different jobs I've gone into. I only know that because I've done it. So there's me putting my hand up and saying, yes, I am guilty of that too. We all do it. And the sooner we kind of realize that we do that and get to grips with it and own it and be able to understand it, then the closer we'll get to being able to stop doing it, if that makes sense. Okay, that, that's really what the key to that bit is. So you might be wondering, how do I become aware of the games that I play? So it's very simple from my perspective in terms of the early steps, okay? You need to notice what ego state you're in when you're communicating. So begin to try and notice that now after the session if you can. Um, you know, at least a couple of times a day, check in and be like, oh, when I was having that conversation earlier, where was I coming from? What ego state do I think I was in? Try and begin to notice. Analyze your transactions is definitely um, a very quick way to help you do it. But I don't know if anybody has the patience these days to write down full conversations they've had and actually go through them. But it actually is a very useful tool. The biggest thing that I have to say to people is to be patient. You know, when I first started learning TA, I was like, oh, that's it. Great. I found the answer to all of my problems. I am going to be the nicest, most humble, compassionate, caring human being that there ever was that walked this earth and I'm just going to make it happen. I'm not going to play any more games. Um, I'm going to analyze all of my transactions. I'm going to become super aware and grounded. And you know, that's just a, a lie we feed ourselves because our ego likes it. Um, but be patient with yourself. That's the key message for me. Um, it takes quite a long time to become aware of where we're coming from. So what I'm saying is the journey might begin today for you if that's a journey you want to go on, but it might be a journey you're on for quite a long time. I'm still on mine and I will be for the rest of my life where your awareness levels about what you're saying, where it's coming from, what informed it from your childhood is ever growing and present and it will be something that comes back and you'll still get tripped up and you'll still play games that you wish you hadn't played and get into all sorts of altercations with people and you'll go, I thought I was beyond all of that unfortunately not there isn't a cure-all you know because we are sociable human beings um so we're not perfect but um starting to notice and become more aware will help you a lot now so i have two chats here oh that's no problem Aoife you're grand um perfect cool nothing else right um and then the last bit is um to make different choices. So once you become aware of what ego state you're in and what your transactions are like and are you playing games, then it's really on you to take personal responsibility 
and you either make different choices or you don't. So you either choose to stop playing the games, choose to stop stepping into roles like persecutor, victim, or a rescuer, or you don't. And that is up to you because that choice does lie with you. It's within your full psychological autonomy to make different choices about how you respond and react to situations. And then the last bit before we kind of wrap up for Q&A is around fostering healthy cultures. So one of the items on the agenda was how do you foster healthier cultures in, in the organization? And this is very much from my perspective. This isn't necessarily TA informed. This is from my own uh, years of working in organizations and seeing what works and what doesn't work. And that's not just from TA, but from all levels of organizational management and development is that you need to lead uh, by example and get to know who you are and what your personality structure is like and how you communicate and what games you play because you have to lead by example so that means you getting to grips with who you are because unfortunately like it or not if you're at the top of an organization if you own it if you're managing it you're having a very big influence on all of the people that work in that organization whether you like it or not or whether you accept it or not so uh, you need to check out who you are and uh, investigate that and then make the necessary changes for healthier working relationships. So, you know, it does mean the doing mean you doing a little bit of personal work. Um, if what you find out is that you play a lot of games and you're a big persecutor or you have a huge critical aspect to your parent ego state and not much nurturing, if you find that out and you want to work on it, then do it because that will have a huge impact again on the people you work with so just you changing yourself will have a huge impact on others invest i can't stress enough how much i think it's important for organizations to invest in training and coaching for themselves and their people um i was fortunate in my early career to work for an uh, organization that did invest an awful lot in their people development and it has benefited me so much. But also, do you know what? I really respect that organization still to this day. I still think about them. I still think about the people I worked with there. And I go, oh my God, like I was so lucky to have worked with those people. They really cared about their people. I felt very nurtured. I would say actually that I kind of grew up in that organization. You know, I started working there when I was 18. And it felt for me that like I grew up there because they were so nurturing. So I think you really need to invest because people really are your biggest asset. And some people will disagree with me. You know, you might have a lunch and learn in a couple of weeks where people will be talking about capital investment and all that sort of stuff. And they'll be saying, no, forget about the people, automation is the way, all that sort of stuff. But, you know, for me, of course, I'm going to be saying that people are your biggest asset and you need to take that seriously. And then the last one is swivel. So I think this is really important. This is something I learned when I was uh, a junior manager about 360 degree uh, swiveling, you know, about really looking around the breadth and depth of your organization, like really looking at, it, at every aspect of it before you make a decision. Because if you can make people led decisions, you're going to be a lot more successful. Going back again to that company that I worked with when I was just starting out my career, they were a phenomenally exceptionally successful company and they still to this day say that they're all of their success is down to their people and it's not hard for me to draw the conclusion that their people are hugely successful and as a result the organization is because the organization really values them and puts a lot of time and work into developing them and nurturing them so that's the last bit around healthy cultures um, a little bit of a shameless pluck. <laughs> um, so I've developed a program called Tactics. Uh, Tactics is a TA-based management and leadership program. I work with managers and leaders at all levels, teaching, coaching, um, and supporting them to develop their understanding of themselves and their teams so that they can become psychologically successful. So that's just out there for people who may or may not be interested. Um, if you are interested, you can you can find a way of getting in touch with me and we can talk about that. But that's one of my my main areas of work today is is um, is delivering tactics and that's the program that's currently being delivered um, to, to Google.
And the last bit then is because I am a true educator at heart. I'd like you to just take a moment now at the end of the session and just jot down some very brief notes, you know, maybe just four bullet points, one for each question. What has happened so far in the session? What have you learned that you didn't know? What are you thinking about as a result? So what's uppermost for you? And it could be a feeling, a sensation, a, a thought. And what are you going to do next? Because like a true coach, <laughs> I'm very focused on action because nothing changes without it. So even with our short session today, it may have stimulated people in a certain way to kind of go, oh, that's interesting. And as a result, my invitation to you is write down an action you're going to take now as a result and commit to it, however small or big it might be. Okay, so how did we do on time in the end? Or am I 10 minutes or oh, 20 minutes over? Yeah, typical me. So uh, thank you very much for your time. I'm happy to take any questions. I'll probably hang on for the next 10, 15 minutes, depending on how many people want to query, question me. Um, so yeah, feel free to come off mute, um, say what you'd like to say, ask me questions, happy to go back over anything. My contact details are on the screen. You can also check out my website. I'm on Twitter, LinkedIn. And uh, if anybody wants the deck, all you should do is drop me an email or contact me on LinkedIn or Twitter and I'll send it to you. No problem at all. Any questions from anybody? Okay, when I have a question here. No problem, Todd, you're very welcome. Um, Edith, so in leading a company, we have talked about communicating in an adult adult transaction with our employees rather than a parent to child transaction. But how do we still stay in a manager position and have the leader effect on our employees in an adult adult style? Wouldn't an authoritative parent role be more efficient? That is an interesting, um, that is an interesting thought. Okay. So I suppose I would come from uh, the point of view you live that no is the answer to that question. Um, because and, and you have to forgive me because I'm, I'm going to criticize that thinking, but it's, I'm not criticizing you, I'm criticizing the thinking. Um, that is old style management talk, you know, that, and it kind of comes from this nature of hierarchy, okay? So it's like, I'm the manager, they're the team, main, uh, team uh, member, I'm up here, they're down there. So today, when I draw um, organizational charts, I don't do hierarchical charts. I put the leader in the middle and uh, in a circle, okay? So I put the leader right in the center and then I build outwards from there because I don't like, um, that's no problem ever. Thank you very much for joining. Bye. Um, I, I don't like this hierarchical approach to leadership. I don't think it's, it's effective. So actually change my words, not that I don't like it. I don't think it's effective. And I don't think it's effective because I have seen where it's fallen down. And, and really what happens is because people get into this parent-child dynamic that we've been talking about, and it's just not healthy always. It has its place. You're welcome, Declan. Thanks very much for joining. Thanks very much, Annie. You're very welcome. Um, yeah, you, you get into this dynamic and it's not always healthy. So it has your time and place for parent-child uh, interactions. But most of the time in organizations, if we can get to an adult to adult place, it's much more useful because what happens is the team member develops respect um, for, for the leader as well. And that's the key piece. It's about having respect because they are a human being. They don't need to uh, be managed in an autocratic way. Is that, yeah, is that helpful? That was actually what I thought because um, I thought about respect uh, yeah. in a position of you know, will I get respect when I do that style? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Okay, that's, that's, a re that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like your thinking. So for me, you, you will get respect because you're being human. Now, does that mean everyone will respect you? No, because you might have a team member whose agenda is to attack your power 
or your position of power because they don't like authority. So it's really good for you to be able to access your potency and your autonomy and agency, okay, as a manager or leader, and be able to sit down with that team member and say, you know, I really want to work with you. I'm not here to put my power over you, but it feels sometimes like you really don't respect me. And I demand respect. Uh, for me, it's a, a baseline. So you don't have to like me as a person. We don't have to be friends. But if we're to have a working relationship, I demand respect. And that means that sometimes you need to check out the way that you communicate with me because I put a lot of thought into the way that I communicate with you and I'm always trying to be respectful. So it's about having those, what some managers might see as dangerous conversations because it's like, ooh, that's a touchy subject. How am I going to get into that with an employee? And I really encourage it. I really encourage to have dangerous conversations because they're not dangerous. It's just, we're not used to having them. We're not used to being that vulnerable and open. But if you're feeling like somebody's not respecting you, the best way to deal with it and to get respect is to share that with them and to say that you're not going to tolerate it, but not to enforce some sort of parentified behavior so that uh, they, they automatically respect you because that's not going to work. It's going to lead to a game. Is that helpful? Good. Any questions from anybody else? No. Okay. I think we'll probably wrap it up there, guys, if, uh, unless anybody else has a question. Nope. You're very, work. You're very, very welcome. Very welcome. Great, okay. You're welcome, Mick. I will try to stop rescuing. It's not easy. <laughs> Trust me, I'm a, I'm a class A rescuer. <laughs> it actually got to the extent, Mick, where uh, I used to notice, you know, when I'd be in a, a working environment uh, and, the, you know, often these screens or projectors might not be working. Somebody would be all set up to do a session and they're without fail. There's always a technical glitch, isn't there? And I actually began to become aware and notice myself that when that happened, I had this compulsion to go and fix the projector without anyone asking me. I would have to get up and I would have to sort it out. So I really worked on just saying, actually, do you know what? No, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to wait for somebody to ask me to go up and help them. Because if I don't get asked to fix the problem, I'm rescuing. Because the assumption is when I get up and say, oh, stand back, I'll do it, is that nobody else is able except for me. So I had to work really hard on that. So there's subtleties to it. <laughs> You're very welcome. I appreciate your further. Yeah, absolutely. I am more than happy to share. Right. Well, I think that's everyone done, unless anyone has any final questions. Nope. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I'm going to close the session down now. And it was lovely to meet you all. Bye. I actually asked, will you be doing any more webinars? I don't know. I'm happy to do more webinars for um, from Republic of Work. I'm not booked in, if they ask me to, I'm not booked in um, with anybody else for a webinar uh, on organizational work, although I am doing a webinar for the Burn Institute in the UK, uh, which is a transaction analysis training institute at the end of June, but it's on a psychosexual subject. Uh, it's on an organizational development because my work is very varied and broad. So uh, when I'm doing webinars, it can be on anything and everything. But if you're interested in that, you're welcome to join. The details are on my Twitter. All right. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Bye.